So first and foremost, uh, my name is Lillian Macharia, and I'm the director of portfolio management at the Green Climate Fund. I would like to welcome you to our session this afternoon, and thank you very much for creating time to be with us. As you might be aware, um, the government, uh, I mean, the, the GCF is responding to the mandate that we have received um, prior to COP27 from the heads of government meetings in August 2022, also from the Pacific Islands Forum, as well as from Forum of Economic Ministers meeting in August 2022 to support uh, Blue Economy. And we also know right now that the SDG 14 is the least funded goal amongst the 17 SDGs. And just to emphasize that it is also really important to invest in blue economy to address both the climate issues and ocean conservation. And just again, would like to highlight the fact that although GCF doesn't have account for the biggest proportion of all the climate finance, our proportion of uh, funding that goes towards blue economy is significantly higher than, for example, the proportion that the ODA uh, of ODA channels to um, blue economy. If I can just cite a few statistics, um, ODA flows to blue economy is about 0.1%, and currently GCF is dedicating at least 4% of its funds towards blue economy. So relatively, we are actually doing way and above what our, I would say the rest of the, um, our peers are doing. And um, so far, we've invested over um, 848 million worth of dollars in 22 projects that directly contributes to the sustainable um, oceans with a co-financing of uh, $1.4 billion. And right now, we are looking at launching the Blue, uh, the Blue Coal as a co-investment platform because we know that the funding required to actually uh, support life underwater um, is a lot. It's significant and it's humongous. So to mobilize that, we need, we need to be able to mobilize resources from different partners, and we're using our convening power to be able to do this. So in order to give you a bit more details to that, I have with me uh, my colleagues to speak to this. I have starting, starting on my, uh, with on the right, uh, with the left-hand side, uh, Jerry, who will speak to us on what GCF is doing on that, and then we'll have other members of the panel who I will introduce as we go along. Thank you very much. German Velasquez, who's a director of D Division of Mitigation and Adaptation at the Green Climate Fund. Jerry? Thank you very much. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, now it's on. No, that's right. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello, yes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Lillian. And um, I'm, I, I think I'm a little bit humbled because I'm in the presence of uh, great. Uh, Institutions and people who actually work on blue economy, who are my role models. So I'm very thankful to be in this panel. Um, so maybe I'll give you a brief overview of what we do uh, on blue economy and what is blue coal, because you may be wondering, blue coal, what is it? Is it why blue, why not pink? Why coal, is it a company? So maybe a short introduction of what it is. So blue coal is a sustainable blue economy co-investment facility. So maybe to give you a, to begin, uh, next slide, please. I think uh, Lillian has already mentioned. Uh, yeah, I, it's me who has to do the next slide. Uh, as we know, a lot of the small island states have been in lockdown for the last two and a half years because of COVID. And uh, most of them are uh, highly indebted. Some of them have actually graduated to high income status. That This means that they have no access to concessional finance. But it does not mean that being high income, that they can escape the impacts of climate change. So it means that they have little resources to deal with the impacts of climate change. And with the ongoing war in Ukraine, it actually has a huge impact on them because fuel prices are high, it disrupts the supply chain to them, and creates a lot of economic problems. And what's happening now in most countries is that they are regressing in their protection promises that they've already made. Some countries, they had a uh, legislation to protect 80% of the marine. Now they're coming up with legislation to reduce this to 30% because they have no other means. 
they need to do this to sustain their people. So as uh, Lillian already said, the investment gap is uh, very large. SDG 14, the least invested of all the SDGs. And it is not just us, it is everybody. And it's very, very worrying. You know, it's uh, the public sector, the private sector, the multilateral development agencies. So we need to change this. And the question is, how do we change this? How do we invest, get more money into life underwater? So that is the concept, therefore, that we have created BlueCo, a sustainable blue economy co-investment facility, which is a blended finance partnership that will make substantial impact towards meeting the climate change and SDG 14 targets. So instead of what we usually do, ad hoc project by project approach, we would like to have a coordinated programmatic approach. It could still be a lot of projects, but it will be coordinated under the purview of governments because we would like to give the purview and overview of these projects to the governments. Uh, we would like to have a, a flexible investment capital. Most countries cannot take on more sovereign debt. So how can we get more money without getting more sovereign debt? Right? Can we change bad debt to good debt? Debt swaps, number one. Can we raise capital from, uh, from the private sector? Bonds. Right? And uh, later on, you'll hear from, uh, from Jennifer Morris from PNC because they've done this in developing countries. This is not theoretical. They've actually done this. And obviously, the, the other thing is that how do we then uh, do this so that we actually crowd in private sector? Private sector, you know, how can we make it less risky for private sector so they invest in oceans? And I think we have uh, somebody here from Pegasus who have uh, also implementing our project on the Global Fund for Coral Reefs which is one of those projects that are investing in oceans. So that is the whole concept of Bluco. Oops, that was so fast. Maybe somebody could help me. So um, Lillian mentioned that we've gotten mandates. So um, when uh, the, pa the Pacific Finance and Economic Ministers met in August, they actually welcomed the support offered by GCF and UNDP to further elaborate the feasibility of innovative uh, uh, climate financing instruments. So in the Pacific, they've already had a regional meeting on debt swaps. They met in April. In addition, they're looking at innovative uh, instruments. Fiji is launching a blue bonds. Niue is uh, launching you should try and Google this, an ocean conservation credit swap. Very, very innovative in Niue. So there is a lot of this being piloted, but they wanted to know what will be this uh, for each and every country. In the Caribbean, the heads of government in preparation for this asked us to help them develop a regional strategy. So there is a lot of interest. And as you see, uh, the only question is, how do we work together? So what is Bluco? What we're hoping is to create a facility that will invest in low emission shipping and ports, waste management and circular economy, coastal marine ecosystem protection, including marine protected areas and blue carbon, coastal livelihoods protection and promotion, fisheries, seafood, tourism, and offshore energy. How are we going to do this? We're going to leverage our grants, grant financing, no repayment, to enabling environment, development of frameworks. Most countries do not have a national blue economy strategy. As of now, OECD has only helped three countries, Cape Verde, uh, Cape Verde uh, Fiji, and Indonesia. So most countries do not have a strategy. Therefore, they cannot develop the pipeline of projects. They do not know what kind of projects they need for blue economy. We need to help them from the bottom up. So it, it's owned by the countries. We need to have the pipeline development because it is not easy. Maybe we will hear from colleagues here. It's not easy to mature pipelines. And then we need to develop uh, these innovative instruments. It's not cheap to develop a blue bond. It's not cheap to negotiate a debt swap. It's not cheap to structure all of this. You know, so there needs to be some investment in that. In addition to the investments and coordination and learning. So what we're hoping is to do it region by region. As of now, we have now launched two regional uh, uh, facilities that is under preparation. One is Blue Co Pacific, it's coordinated through PIFs. And then Blue Co Caribbean is under discussion, maybe through a CARICOM, 
and our partners there are being selected at the moment. But hopefully we could also do one in Southeast Asia under the uh, purview of ASEAN and Blue Co Western Indian Ocean. Our colleagues from IUCN is here. The, uh, the Great Blue Wall, which is the, uh, the concept that they're calling it, um, uh, maybe through the, uh, the Nairobi Convention. And uh, what we're now offering to, to, to these each and every one is flexible grant, grant initially, to help them develop a regional investment plan. How do, will they do this? Through the development of a regional blue economy strategy together with national blue economy strategy. We're going to give them the grant to enable them to develop the strategy. In addition, we will do the feasibility study of what kind of instruments will apply for each and every country. And we are going to uh, invest in a few pilots, maybe on Blue Carmen in the Bahamas, uh, maybe uh, on seafood in Palau, and so on and so forth. Maybe fisheries in, um, in Barbados. And we hope that this could then inspire a larger set of projects. So this is the structure. What we are hoping is that we are going to provide some flexible grant through the mechanism, through the regional bodies, so that they can then convene regularly these meetings allowing them for any project, any of us, it's not one project, many projects, but they should be a jigsaw puzzle that when they connect, they actually form a picture. So that's the goal. So let a thousand flowers bloom, but it should be coordinated because we don't have any more time. So we will do public and private, and it's either on the investment funding or on the investment projects. So this is what we're hoping. It's not just public sector, uh, also private sector. And I'm going to show you, this is something we're working on in Indonesia. We are launching this at G20 next week. And we are very thankful for the leadership of the government of Indonesia. This is the first ever sustainable self-financing marine protected areas and fisheries in the world at scale. So Blue Halo S is being launched next week through the leadership of the government of Indonesia at the G20. So I'm not going to steal the thunder because we have the colleague here from the Minister of Fisheries from Indonesia who can tell you more about it, but they are leading the way for this. We hope that if this works, it could be replicated in not just Indonesia, but any other small island state. So GCF, um, I, I could uh, explain a little bit more, but what our experience is, our partners are working diligently on this, but we could offer the, the need that they, that they want in a one-stop shop. Because right now, some of them will tell you, it's very difficult to structure one project in one country. You have to take, go into like four or five different partners. You need to go to the USDFC to get um, an insurance scheme to, to enhance the credit. You need to develop something to enhance the project preparation. You need to work with another partner for something else. So what we are hoping is that we would provide the flexible facility to then allow partners like TNC, IDB, ADB to actually invest at scale. And our goal is to bring it to scale so that the actual implementation on the ground is at scale. So I will stop there, but uh, to say that uh, we are very thankful for Indonesia, TNC, and Vanuatu, who are our champions in this regard. Thank you very much. Very many thanks to Jerry. Big words, big vision, a lot happening here. So I think now the question is, where is the demand? I mean, we have all these big, we've had all of this before, right? The world is going to change. We're going to get the blue, you know, economy running. So I think the question is, where is the demand? I think, and, and for that, we are turning to Mr. Bakao Kaltonga, who is the special envoy for Vanuatu, and who will tell us from the perspective of the Pacific Island, where they see the value in the blue economy investments and what they see as the opportunities. Where can a, a Pacific island benefit and what are the opportunities? Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, moderator, and <clears throat> thank you for inviting Vanuatu. Ours is the voice of the Pacific region uh, to speak uh, on, on, on this matter. You will appreciate that the Pacific Island Forums recently endorsed its strategy of the Pacific Blue Continent uh, 2050. And you would appreciate the fast ocean uh, when you consider the Pacific Island countries being small island nations 
but with the 200 miles economic zone, uh, the area of the ocean covers uh, quite a large area, which is perhaps greater than some of the land continents. And so you will appreciate that <coughs> uh, the ocean is very much part of our livelihood and culture. And therefore, we do depend and on oceans for resources. Uh, and But you'll also appreciate that being small islands, uh, we face more challenges, especially in the ensuing climate crisis that uh, affect quite a number of areas. So uh, if any, we would welcome, our communities would welcome uh, uh, more assistance in terms of finance from uh, the uh, Green Climate Fund or, or wherever because uh, uh, ours is a litany of uh, uncertainty and also a litany of false promises from what is supposed to be for small countries who uh, give less, the least number of emissions but having to feel the brunt of the greater industrial nation. So you will appreciate the uh, importance of us and the importance of assistance towards our communities. And you're looking at uh, issues of coral bleaching, coral reef bleaching, which uh, affects our uh, marine environment and the food environment and due to acidification and due to a lot of carbon dioxide that goes into the oceans. Uh, whereas in the past we were facing category cyclones of at least once in a half a century, we're facing three in a decade. So it affects our ocean communities. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, cyclone breakages. It affects our drinking waters in the coastal communities. And uh, we're also looking at, uh, uh, on, on a greater scale, uh, temperature-based tuna migration, which, because of temperature changes in our waters, the tuna migrate go elsewhere and we lose a lot of revenue. So these are the sort of various small island Pacific countries are faced with and need this sort of funding. And so when we look at <clears throat> the number of adaptation finance that is being promised, it is too small considering the effect of, of, of what's happening and the challenges we face, especially communities. And we're even advocating, we're even advocating that you now perhaps we shouldn't be measuring issues per degree Celsius, but it's per human lives are affected. That's the bleak future we face with our communities. And and so we're uh, we're uh, taking on an initiative, Honourable Minister. And that is uh, uh, to put the, the, the question to the International Court of Justice through a United Nations General Assembly resolution. And that is to seek clarity, seek an advisory opinion, clarifying and putting some moral clarity on the international treaties, both women, children, and also on the, on the lower standard assistance that will 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 identify the obligation of states to um to 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 climate change and so this will uh provide an avenue for greater clarity and common ground for everybody but also provide us the ability to access funding and provide control finances that go to specific areas and this is where we can assist uh, uh organizations such as your choice I must say thank you very much for assisting the communities of Vanuatu with you, and it's the biggest project in, 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 in the Pacific. And, and, and this way we can coordinate between countries and organizations in order to tackle the issues. And, and, and being sovereign countries, um, we are able to muster. And I would like to inform you that Vanuatu's initiative has the full support of the African and Pacific countries of some 78 countries, which will get this matter past the UNJ so we can have, and you may also become, as soon as the case goes, we become part of the, uh, 
organizations and countries can become part of Vanuatu's case and explain and argue that this is the sort of thing we're facing. And, uh, uh, and today we'd be happy to hear some of the projects with uh, our Honorable Minister from Indonesia on these matters. And we also, as small island countries, need more assistance. We need to work on it. The problems are there. We need to help us identify them, structure them properly so they're presentable, so we can get finance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Special Envoy. I think you've heard uh, the importance of uh, partnership between countries and organizations. Uh, small islands really see the value in the sustainable support in terms of their livelihoods. And um, there is a story of broken promises. I'm sure GCF is not one of them. You've got two approvals of projects this year, Vanuatu. So this is, we, I think we're doing well. Yes, yes, yes. So I think we, 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 we hope we are we are, we are changing that narrative. Um, and then, yes, so we'll now turn over to Mr. Mohammed to give us a bit of Indonesia. I think Jerry has indicated that you are launching Blue Halo. So tell us a bit about, you know, how Indonesia is addressing um, this, the blue economy. And also tell us also a little bit about the Blue Halo and what you see as opportunities going ahead. Thank you, moderator. I am very pleasant to be here today uh, in the afternoon. And uh, my minister apology is not to be here today. And he, he uh, delivered best regard to all of us to uh, attend this uh, meeting. Uh, allow me to, uh, first of all, I introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Muhammad Yusuf. I am a director of uh, Coastal and Small Island uh, Utilization, Marine Affairs and Fisheries Department, uh, minister, Ministry. Uh, allow me to read the, uh, my minister remarks, so I hope uh, this is uh, very relevant for what uh, we are talking about to this, this afternoon. Excellencies, uh, distinguished chair and delegates, uh, you know that Indonesia is the largest archipelagic uh, state with the best marine biodiversity. Indonesia realized that our marine ecosystem, especially the blue carbon, plays important roles in maintaining ocean health and controlling climate change. Indonesia water, Indonesian water that extends around 1.4 million kilometers square, provides key habitats for fish and other marine bio biodiversity which uh, reside among more than we have uh, 17, 70 and um, 500,000 island it is right i don't know uh, blue carbon resources um, such as seagrass and uh, mangroves they scratch along one 108,000 uh, kilometers. Uh, that uh, play a significant, significant roles in, in uh, global climate change mitigation. Indonesia commit to make healthy and sustainable ocean, fighting illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing practices, crime and social abuse in uh, fishery sector and developing blue economy. Indonesia blue economy policy is implemented through five strategy, namely the first one, spending marine protected area to 30 percent the total extent of Indonesian water, uh, marine water, I mean, or as approximately uh, 97.5 million hectares by 2045. In addition to increase oxygen product production, such as conservation effort to extend the preserved fish spawning ground and blue carbon stock. The second one, quota-based capture fisheries policy, which applying sustainable, sustainable principle in fish resources management, including limiting fish fleets. Uh, that 
that could be uh, contribute to greenhouse emission reduction because uh, the quota we, we divide in some zone the fleet another zone could cannot be in enter the, the, the zone so we divided in maybe five zone so the the fishing the fishing puzzle just can capture in that zone they not enter another zone so it uh, you know indonesia in java they can uh, catch fish in arafuru that's very far but, but this is uh, uh, our minister policy is not allowed the third uh, marine and coastal inland aquaculture management that aims to high economic value commodities one of the policy means it um, the the practices in the aquaculture is emission using low emission practices and renewable energy for aquaculture activities the fourth marine coastal and small island sustainability management the policy ensure that all activities in marine area comply with the government marine special allocation so we uh, all indonesia have special planning allocation according to the activities no all activities should be suitable uh, to the allocation uh, it's it's including management protection in of blue carbon ecosystem area in that spe special planning the last one marine litter management policy you know indonesia the second one uh, that the, the second yeah, the second uh, marine litter in the ocean so this the last this this strategy is how the how the fishermen uh, go with the government collect the litter beside the catching the fish so this is a uh, how to increase the the uh, campaign not not through the litter to the ocean you you know by indonesia there's many people around the coastal area they have to uh, increase their responsibility to the to the ocean okay uh, financing sustainability marine sector is critical for the su success of the blue economy therefore we invite private sector to take these opportunities to in invest and contribute to conservation effort in Indonesia. We believe that the financing uh, in sustainable sector is profitable to such investment could be reinvested. So the, the, the generated profit should be used to protect the ocean and local communities. This scheme is expected to improve ocean health, create job, and therefore improve economic welfare of the coastal communities. Finally, such as financing such a system is anticipated to become self-financing cycle, uh, self-financing cycle which align with the all stakeholders, including uh, private, local communities, and government. I think that is a remark from our minister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mohammed. Um, so finally, uh, we go on to Jennifer Morris, who's the CEO of the Nature Conservancy. It's an institution that has done very, very innovative things that have had significant impact. Um, I'm aware that you've already done some debt swaps for some, some of the vulnerable countries, and I think we'd like to hear from you um, about uh, some of the innovative things you're doing. We know you've done some announcement of some of those initiatives in the Caribbean this year. So if you could tell us a little bit about how that works and um, what opportunities you see about this working with the con in the context of blue economy, uh, the blue coal. And yeah, and what, what opportunities you see there? Sure, great. Thanks so much. Can you guys hear me okay? So good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for hosting this panel and for inviting me. And I just want to 
Um, also give huge credit to the two gentlemen to my left and the incredible work that you're doing in, in your countries. Um, before I talk about debt swaps, I'd like to mention the importance of this conversation. Now, you, you mentioned that the GCF funding is better than ODA, but let's remember the oceans are 70% of this planet, and we're investing less than 10% of our funds in that. And, you know, a, a phrase that comes to mind is conservation without money is just conversation. And we can't, we have to stop talking and we have to start investing. And that's why I'm so excited about what the GCF is stepping up to do, what the GEF, our colleagues next door, are doing on the oceans and what so many other organizations represented here need to be doing when it comes to ocean finance. We know there's not enough philanthropy in the world to solve our development challenges when it comes to the oceans. We know we need to crowd in, as Jerry said, crowd in the private sector. And I'll spend a couple minutes now talking about an innovative new approach, not so new actually, but something that we're pioneering now, which finally is going from project to scale. And that's this whole area what we call blue bonds. So this started in 2016 with a transaction we did with the government of the Seychelles. The government of the Seychelles had high levels of debt, like many countries. In fact, now 60% of developing countries have high stress debt, have unsustainable debt. So when we think about the crises that we're facing our world, biodiversity, climate, we can't forget about the debt crisis. There is no way we can expect developing countries to pay this level of debt service and prepare their countries for what is happening right now in Vanuatu and in Indonesia which is the onslaught of climate change. We as a global community have to be helping. So that's what this, this um, idea does. So in 2016, in the Seychelles, the government came to us and said, can you help us reduce our debt while also investing in conservation? So we were able to, to do that, to do an innovative transaction, the first one. But then it took us another six years to do the next one. And you mentioned the Caribbean. So just last year, we announced an innovative transaction in Belize. There was also a blue bonds where we were able to take sovereign debt that the government of Belize owed to foreign creditors and refinance that and restructure that and save $50 million of that debt service that then went into conservation over 15 years through a trust fund facility. And they went from less than 10% of their marine conservation area to 30%. So this whole approach is a quid pro quo. So the government say, we want to invest more in conservation. We want to have 30 by 30 as our target. And we will work with them to finance that through a debt restructuring facility. So Belize was last year. Most recently, we announced uh, two months ago a transaction with the government of Barbados. So same kind of approach where we were able to save the government lots of money in terms of debt service, refinance it, and crowd in the private sector through a, a restructured facility, which pulled out the, the number of payments over many years, saved them significant money. And we did this without any new philanthropic dollars. So that is what I think is quite interesting about this. This is all about private sector financing. Now, we're seeing lots of countries come to us and say, we want to do this. We, this is amazing. How do we do this? We need the GCF. We need the MDBs who play a critical role in helping to underwrite the risk and create investment grade financial products where TNC and banks like Credit Suisse and Bank of America and many other banks want to help issue these bonds, but they can't do it. They can't create these investment grade long term products without guarantee facilities. So we were fortunate to work with the Development Finance Credit, the DFC in the, in the US, and the Inter-American Development Bank, in the case of the Caribbean. And they helped with this transaction. But the reality is, there's insufficient guarantee facilities there. So if the GCF, and Jerry and I were talking about this right before this session started, could provide a pool of money that could go to help support marine conservation, blue economy, developments in the countries that have high debt service where we can do these transactions, it could seriously scale this work. And it can do it with very, very limited philanthropic funds. You mentioned this is difficult. It is. And in fact, the first one we did in Belize, or the second one we did in Belize with, with Credit Suisse, one of the senior managers at Credit Suisse stood up at the Belize launch and said, 
this was the hardest, the most challenging and complicated transaction we have ever done. And we can't wait to do it again because it is just given the banks and the employees at the bank so much hope that they can use. Finally, we've been talking about this for decades. How do we get private money into conservation? Is this kind of this, you know, holy grail? This is doing it. In fact, it's the only investment grade product on the market. It's a long term fixed income product that is going directly into nature conservation. So it can work and it can scale, but we need the multilateral development banks. We need the IDBs, we need the GCFs, we need the GEFs to come and help underwrite some of the risk for the private sector. I think I'll stop there. Well, hold on, one more thing. So the, the scale of this is not only huge in terms of money, we think we can, we can actually, and I said this, it was picked up in the New York Times yesterday, that we, can, we have about $10 billion in pipeline right now that can tra be translated into $2 billion for conservation and can help protect a marine area the size of the United States. So these are the ones that are just in our pipeline now. And we see that, again, with more opportunities from the multilateral institutions, we can go even higher. I was in there. Big hand for her. Wow, Jennifer, that's, that's really stimulating, I think, for everybody. Um, a few questions that I'll follow up, and I could see Jerry itching. Uh, you have a question for her? Okay, a comment. Right. No, thank you uh, very much, Jennifer, for uh, at least enlightening us with uh, the sort of work you're doing. Uh, it's quite encouraging. And I believe it's not an impossibility, and uh, it's basically understanding uh, the construct of our communities and the environment we, we, we live in. Uh, in the Pacific, our constitutions uh, give us the right uh, to exist within our countries, uh, the respect for religion and, and the respect for our customs and culture. So our people own the land, they own the trees, they own the sea, they own the corals, they own the animals. And so <clears throat> this is the combination uh, and the question is the visibility. And uh, therefore, uh, quite a number of our communities have, in, in terms of uh, investment projects, have accessed uh, and identified that uh, the more feasible uh, uh, sources of funding would be uh, 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 sovereign, sovereign assistance because of the nature of the interest rates are being low and negligible. And we've seen this with the, uh, uh, the, the Japanese uh, government and Japanese aid agencies and the Japanese uh, investment banks. Uh, and uh, uh, and where where. I think where it's important is really the preparation of our communities into getting into feasible joint ventures of the scale. And, and you have to bear in mind that we're also faced with the added risk of the climate change. And we need to assist that. So uh, we need finance to do the feasibility studies, to prepare us, to identify our assets, to, so then the risk we're involved in, uh, in order, and, and whether we could help our communities with this sort of investment. And that's where the combination is between the private companies, the firms, the feasibilities, and our communities. And this is the more sustainable approach uh, uh, than some of the programs that is happening around the, around the world. But uh, thank you very much. And uh, it gives us uh, uh, confidence to hear that you are doing this sort of work and helping our communities become sustainable in, 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 within, within, within the challenge we're facing around the world. So thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know, Jennifer, if you had any response to that or? Uh, sure. <laughs> Thanks. No, I completely agree with you. There has to be some financing for feasibility study. And that's, um, I think, something that we're working very hard on is the whole process of marine spatial planning and blue economy work has to be part of the commitments of, of 30 by 30 and, and how you do that in a way that makes sense. So that's, that's definitely something that um, is important. Agreed. Right. So, Jennifer, I don't know if you, uh, I'll turn back to the audience and to the panel if you have any additional comments. 
on questions. Um, but as I go to back to the audience, I have one question for you. You mentioned, is it 10 billion and two? So the question is how much do you need to de-risk that? And is it gonna take six years? Just as maybe, yeah. Um, definitely not going to take six years. Uh, we're seeing the, the speed increase exponentially. So I mentioned the first one was in 2016, but we've done two in the last two years. And watch this space. We should have another two or three in the next six months. So it's really, really scaling. But it could go faster, Jerry, if we had a GCF. So, so this is, again, and, and, and we don't want this just to be a TNC product at all. We want, I mean, I know Pew's working on one. We've got lots of organizations that are doing this, this is how we really scale, is when other organizations take up this idea and do it themselves. Because it's absolutely critical. There's no way that TNC should or could be doing all these around the world. So we want everyone to, to be you know, modeling this. And, that's, and we're also talking to the IMF and the World Bank about doing more KPI-linked loans in the future. And they're already doing KPI-linked loans, but really focused on the 30 by 30. But again, it's not just about new debt to the point that was made, but how do we ensure we reduce the debt burden of these countries that are, are really are suffering now from those triple crises in addition to COVID recovery and everything else you're faced with. These debt burdens are not sustainable. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Leo Brewster here from Barbados. So thanks for... Hello? Right. Uh, Leo Brewster, Barbados. Thanks for the commendation. Um, yes, we've recently just signed off with the new uh, Blue Bond Debt for Nature swap. And I think that um, from our own end, we are trying to prepare ourselves for the implementation. And one of the biggest concerns that we obviously have is the technical capacity institutionally to ensure that it can be implemented successfully. So we just want to make sure that as part of the whole process, there is that trade-off and continuity into the future. Thank you. Rosalind Steen from AXA Group and AXA Excel, our large commercial lines carrier, was really pleased to have been a part of the project in, in Belize and de-risking that project. My question is for the panel. How Could you explain how the refinancing process is helping reduce that debt burden for these countries? It would be interesting for us to know more about that. Thank you. I'll give Jerry to start with the last question. I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that. Jennifer is the best person. Basically, you change the way that, um, I think in the case of Belize, it was trading as junk bond uh, debt because um, they could not pay back. So it was, uh, I think, trading at uh, 40 cents to the dollar, $500 million of debt. If they had the money, if they had the money, they could save, if they were able to buy that debt, they could save right off the bat because it was trading among banks at such a discount, but they didn't have the money. So they raised uh, a bond to actually pay back that debt. So they raised the bond to pay back that debt. Now, the question there is, how do you raise a bond that interest rate is lower than that debt? And they were able to do this by creating a credit enhancement facility. They got the, um, the USDFC to guarantee that through an insurance. Yeah, and that allowed the interest rate to go down. So from a high interest rate to a low interest rate. And in fact, this, what they've done is enhance the credit of the country. I think Belize came out of that with an enhanced credit rating. I don't, Jennifer, you could correct me if I'm wrong. So they enhanced the credit rating of the country, which is fantastic. And many countries uh, uh, talk about debt swap. Here it is. This is the way to do it. We think about conceptually, how can you use debt swap? And they have done this three times. My question in my mind really to Jennifer is that why are we not doing more of this? That's all. I mean, it's such a no brainer. I think we should be like doing like 10, 20 of it. Jennifer, I have something to add? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. So you're, you're pulling out the payments, you're restructuring it, you're reducing a lot of the interest burden in particular to be able to go into conservation. So that's the main way, but, but yes, yeah, so it's a great question. I think, um, it took it took a risk. I mean, to be honest, you know, the risk that was taken by the first bank that we worked with, Credit Suisse, cannot be understated because this had never been done before. And they they really, even though there was credit enhancements, this was a new radical idea. 
And the fact that they were willing to take that step. So any, if there's any private sector banks in the, in the room, you're talking to your senior managers to take this risk to change the planet, to get more money into countries who need it the most and reduce their debt burdens at the same time. It does take a forward thinking organization. It takes institutions like the GCF to say, look, we can do this. We can help underwrite the private sector and crowd more money in to, to help sovereigns. So I think, so that's why probably there was just that inertia, but now it's like anything changes very, very slow. And then once it happens, it can go very fast as people see these examples, the lighthouses of success. Again, we're seeing this just this onslaught of demand that my team can't even barely keep up with because it's not only the, the financing piece, but of course, it's the very important conservation piece and partnering with governments that have sometimes great capacity, but sometimes limited capacity to do all the marine spatial planning work, the blue economy work that's required to achieve that 30% goal. I will say there's also other components of these deals that are quite interesting, which we don't have time to go into, but around parametric insurance making sure that when, uh, there's also a, a really interesting one in, in Barbados. Um, it's, a, it's a pandemic clause. So, so that immediately pays out if there's another pandemic because of the loss of tourism revenue in, in a place like Barbados, which is so reliant on, on tourism revenue. So there's many different components of this deal structure that I'm super excited about and can geek out about it all day. But just to say this, I think now, Jerry, again, with your help, we can see the scale in, in great new ways. We have a question at the back. Yeah, just stand up so you can see me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jennifer, thank you very much. We're really uh, exciting to, to listen to what you guys are doing. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Carlos Lee Morrissey from the Pacific Island Forum. Hi, Jerry. Um, good to see you. you guys put our name up there that we are talking to you guys about the blue code. Um, we've been looking at blue bonds. You, you probably know Fiji issued a green bond a few years back, 2017, I think. Uh, we've been looking at blue bonds and did swaps. The issue we have in the Pacific is scale. And we've been looking at the possibility of regional approaches. We can get collect and pool debt. I know it's a little bit difficult, but there's issues around uh, obviously the financial institutions the varying financial varying uh, legislations, and also the varying credit ratings. Would you be interested in looking? It's sort of like a question and a challenge as well, so you can help us pull together regional pooling of debt and do debt swap in a, in a you know, more than, more than a uh, unilateral scale. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you want to? Thank you. Graciela Reyes from the Mexican Fund for the Conservation of Nature. We are an, a private environmental fund and also a national accredited entity. My question is for Jerry. Jerry? <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, can I? Thank you, thank you so much. We are a national accredited entity from Mexico. We are now developing a PPF for a project called Acción for the Yucatan Peninsula, where we are gonna develop with TNC a uh, parametric insu insurance. We also have a blue carbon hub for the Yucatan Peninsula and many, many other activities really aligned with, the, with Blue Co. So my question is, is there an opportunity for other countries that are not islands to join the Blue Co for projects that are already developing in the GCF? This is gonna be a GCF fund uh, project uh, financed only with grants. So it will serve exactly with what Jennifer was saying, no, like catalyzing the finance that is needed from the private sector. We have the commitment of the private sector to accept the risk, so it's amazing. Very many thanks. Jennifer? Jerry, Jerry, on the spot. Many thanks. No, we, we are, you know, following the mandates of the countries. If there is demand, we will work on this. So, in fact, uh, the next step for us is uh, to see what the demands are beyond the Caribbean and the Pacific and Indonesia. If there is demand, the rest of Latin America, if there is demand in the Western Indian Ocean, we would like to work with IUCN, for example, uh, on the Great Blue Wall in Western Indian Ocean and the rest of the, the world. But beyond um, ocean conservation, we also would like to, to, to pair this. So we're working on uh, green carbon also. We are working on, uh, on uh, forest uh, conservation. We're also working on forest bonds. So I think there's a lot of opportunity and um, we would, I think we should discuss more on the side. Thank you. We have another question. Thank you so much. My name is Isaac Nyaroya. I come from Lake Victoria Basin Commission, uh, an institution of uh, East African community. My question is to Director Jelly. 
Uh, you talked about the, the grant facility for helping uh, countries develop uh, the, the regional blue economy strategy and also the national strategies, blue economy strategies. And uh, in that region where I come from, uh, of course, we have the Africa blue economy strategy. And we, we also want to uh, uh, also uh, try to develop also the regional economic, uh, the regional blue economy strategy uh, and also support countries uh, in East African uh, community to develop the, their national blue economy strategies. And those are countries, uh, Afri uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, DRC, and the uh, Republic of South Sudan. So my question is, uh, how do that region uh, be able to access grant, uh, that kind of facility, in cases where the regional economic community, like the East African community, or even like Victoria Basin Commission, is not yet uh, uh, you know, accredited? Uh, so in that case, how do we access that kind of grant? Thank you. There are colleagues here from IUCN. Uh, IUCN colleagues, they're here. And they're, in fact, uh, developing a program called the Great Blue Wall of Africa. So I think we, maybe we could have a discussion after this. I think that is one option. Of course, there are other partners that are interested, but they're here. Maybe we could discuss. Quick and efficient, Jerry. Okay. Um, hello. Um, thanks a lot for the discussion. It's uh, good to hear that blue bonds and uh, climate credit swaps are actually happening. So um, I'm interested um, in getting a bit more information on the uh, Blueco platform. So um, I was surprised to hear that AEs are already working with that. So, you know, what are what does a country have to do to um, get access to this platform? Are there any criteria for accessing, or what do accredited entities have to um, yeah, have to do? And then also, um, so if this is happening together with the GCF project, is that actually counting as co-financing, or is that um, yeah, like does it count as co-financing then also? Thank you. Uh, that's for Jerry. So we are a country-driven organization. Based on the request of countries, we work on this. I think in, the, in this audience, you will see a lot of uh, partners. We have GIZ here, we have IUCN. They're all listening to you. So the countries, if you're interested, please do reach out to our partners. We can develop this on your request. So as of now, we have been uh, gotten the request from Indonesia, from uh, Pacific and Caribbean. But if there are more countries that request it, we would be more than happy to, to do this. I think there was a question from uh, our colleague from Fiji uh, regarding Pacific Islands being uh, small operators, but because uh, he's talking about the uh, economics and economies of scale, he asked the question which needs to be answered. Sorry, do you mind it, the, repeating the question? It was about how to achieve economies of scale for islands? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good, so the question was, um, to reframe it, is that can we can we aggregate debt from multiple Pacific Island countries and do a, a, a debt conversion product for multiple countries? I don't know. I think it would be hard, um, but certainly not beyond the, the, the art of the possible. So let's, let's talk about it and I can introduce you to my sovereign debt experts and we can discuss it some more. Um. Uh, so for my colleague from the PIFs, in fact, the mandate we got from the PIFs is to understand what instruments apply to them. So we now are launching uh, a technical feasibility in the Pacific to try and understand what instrument works at national level and regional level. So hopefully with the guidance of the PIFs, we will be able to, to determine this. We will do the feasibility study with this project to try and understand, can we do a regional debt swap? Can we do a regional bond? Can we do something regional or maybe sub-regional, maybe a group of countries? So what we are going to do is do the technical feasibility and hopefully by uh, late next year, we have that and report back to the ministers. Yeah. No, no, no just, just actually, I just wanted to sort of echo a bit this sort of um, uh, on the regional blue bond. That's exactly what we are currently exploring the, the Great Blue Wall Initiative for the Western Indian Ocean region. And indeed, right now, it seems a bit challenging to sort of structure financial product, you know, with basically uh, several countries. One of the first steps that we're trying to 
take is to establish a regional sort of blue hub to help those countries structure this type of financial products and sort of crowding the partners etc to at least accelerate and then investigate if there would be actually a way to sort of come up with like a global regional sort of an SPV and then having um, several sort of um, debt swaps and blue bonds for each of the countries but that would fall under one sub sort of regional umbrella but I think to me to actually achieve scale in particular for those regions such as here in particular the Western Indian Ocean region these sort of this gap that needs to be filled and sort of the, the capacity for us to be able to structure such a instruments at the regional level is going to really really be critical um so i'm very keen to sort of explore and indeed we are already talking with slav on this um but um yeah i i i i uh i perhaps would like to assist you with uh in in, in the pacific the, the the there's some ventures on the industrial scale which work uh which involve borrowing and are very successful but they they're with uh state states because of the level of interest rates uh with these blue bonds and the sort of schemes we're talking about we need to have a good look at it need the feasibility even even if it was to to has my 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 uh, learned colleague was saying that even if it's joint regional, because you, you, you consider the oceans and the 200 miles economic zones of the Pacific countries being small, you're talking about a huge area of resources which we need to tap into. And, and this is the sort of thing we need. We need visibility, we need studies, so we prepare the proper base and groundwork that which, whereby we can launch this scheme. And that's where that component of assistance is important. And my friend is raising that being small islands, perhaps a combination of, 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 of states or groups of states uh, to, to make this work. We need to find solutions to make it work. Hi, um, I'm also from, from AXA, which is a big uh, institutional investor as well as insurer. And I think there's a lot of interest from these kind of big institutional investors to get involved in these kind of structures. Um, but I understand, obviously, from the private sector side, there needs to be some kind of commercial return. And from what I understand, I don't know if it's seen as a very um, commercially profitable area, the blue economy. Is that is that the case? Is, is that an area that needs to be developed? Is it a blocking point? Or because I'm assuming that will be the case for, for attracting private sector investment. You know, these are these are investment grade products. So there's it's a fixed income product. So it's not private equity. It's fixed income. But it's yes. I mean, we wouldn't have the scale or the interest from the commercial banks like Credit Suisse and Deutsche Bank. What's that? Correct. Correct. For the others. Yeah, I, I can't speak to the other uh, the other products in terms of some of the blue co initiatives. The one we're doing in Indonesia is the first time uh, marine protected areas and fisheries will be, in fact, self-sustaining. So there is a fixed income from all of this, and uh, it's being launched at the G20. That's the reason we ca I can't show you the video. So it's under embargo, but it's the first time. So that's the whole thing, to try and come up with a business model that actually is profitable. The main challenge that most small island states are saying is that pure protection alone, the return is not enough it's not enough compared to other uh, means that they are tempted to do like deep ocean mining or you know expand uh, fisheries at scale so there is a lot of temptation because they need the resources to do this and they need the alternative that is self-sustaining so the key is to find that business model that works that there is an income and there is you know otherwise it will not work Okay, um, I think we are getting to the end of this session, um, I, and I don't see any additional questions. I th um, so to wind up, I think you'll all agree it's been a very enriching exchange. I'll ask if any of the panelists have any last words on this blue call. Jennifer, I'll each of, give you each of you a minute to say your last words on what you think about the blue call, the options and the opportunities available, and what you'd like to see. Thank you. 
Sure. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. I guess I would like to see more investment to be commensurate with the scale of the problem um, and the scale of the biome that is the oceans. We're not even near where we need to be. And we know the oceans are absolutely essential for our own survival. So I'd like to see the, the multilateral development banks take a little bit more risk and then we can unlock a lot more money for conservation. Mohammed? Uh, blue, blue Economy Indonesia uh, will be begun with the minist our ministry uh, uh, program to Blue Economy, especially for the marine protected area. I hope the, uh, the private sector or from the other countries or from uh, GCF, I think this can... I, I agree with the, uh, Mr. Jerry what the, the marine protected area with the core zone protected is not be uh, not in, increase them uh, for the people around the around the uh, core um, marine protected area the marine protected area should be benefit for the co uh, people around the marine protected area thank you mohammed and when do they where do they come up and find out more about blue halo bluehalo.s or why is it <laughs> next week next week okay watch that space look this is the domino effect we've been talking about in the pacific we have a vast blue ocean there's so much potential there's so many resources you can even tap the energy the wave energy you're talking about wind energy uh there's a lot of uh, commercial opportunities to be gotten and this is where we should go invest in the Pacific if you want to see this project of blue uh, coal be successful the best place is to spend where your money on where the biggest ocean is <coughs> and that's the Pacific Ocean it 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 is when you consider <coughs> the size of the ocean already you can see the sustainability economy you can handle so many things from this ocean. And, and I, I believe uh, this, we, 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 we're a diamond that's untouched here. We need to unearth. Thank you. So many thanks. As I think Jennifer put it so eloquently, we, can, we cannot have life above water if there is no life underwater. So we really need to start thinking seriously about investing in life underwater. And it's not just one particular area, it's the whole world. And it is so large and it's so important. And we are, on one side, we are uh, not just looking at the threat that it could happen if we don't look at this, but we are over looking at the opportunity. The opportunity is so large. There are so many things that we are overlooking. Blue carbon is not in the NDCs. Many countries, NDCs do not include blue carbon. And there is huge potential to increase the ambition of many countries by including blue carbon. And this is just one of many things. So a lot of countries are promising 30 by 30, but we need to also look at 30 by 30 in the oceans. So I think there is a lot of opportunity. And as uh, called to us by Jennifer, we are here to support you. You are our champions. And uh, you know this is the reason that uh, we're starting is because we are inspired. So thank you uh, from our side. And we hope to work very closely with uh, countries like uh, Vanuatu, Indonesia, Barbados, Fiji, many more. And of course, hopefully soon TNC as an accredited entity of the GCF. Hopefully by March. So thank you very much. Our very great panelists and very uh, great audience for the engagement for all your time. I think we have heard it. Let's think about life underwater and above water for sure. And, and I think there are a lot of opportunities. So let's go and make it happen. We're told it's not talking about it, but doing more about it so thank you so much for your time and have a great afternoon bye everyone